Good morning, First Reformed. It's very good to see everybody on this wonderful Sunday morning. A very warm welcome to you. And if you happen to be a guest, if this is your first time, we just extend a very special welcome to you as well. Our call to worship this morning comes from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Please turn to your red hymnal for verse for song 690, I Know Not Why God's Wondrous Grace, but please remain seated for the first verse. God, we thank you so much for this day. May we seek you today, Lord. God, in you, may we be relieved from all of our fears. God, may we taste and see your goodness today. And may all that we do today glorify you, our God. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we are now going to have a ministry moment. I would like to invite up two members of our outreach committee. Yeah, you can be seated. Uh, so if Stella Kluster and Evie Klein Hexel would like to come up and uh, share our ministry moment. Hey, Stella. Happy Thanksgiving almost. Yeah, and that means Christmas is almost here. Pretty soon, they'll be decorating the mitten tree in the hallway. I think you mean the giving tree. We don't decorate the mitten tree. Some dedicated, dedicated knitters fill it up with handmade mittens, but the giving tree can involve everyone. Two trees? But I heard Ben Ashby say. Well, anyway, that's... <laughs> well, anyway, what's on the giving tree if there aren't any mittens? Well, the giving tree has a few regular ornaments, but the important thing is that it has envelopes where we can put all our money inside to help others at Christmas. Why don't we just stuff money in the mittens? <laughs> There's no mittens, just envelopes. Okay, okay. So what happens to the money then? Well, the outreach team collects the money. Last year it was a little over $4,000 and it turns into Myra gift cards. Then we can give the cards to parents who are having financial difficulties so they can buy stuff their kids need. Why don't we just give them mittens? We have plenty of them. <laughs> mittens are just what some kids need, but other kids may need something else. The whole idea is to let parents buy what they need to give to their families a Merry Christmas. We give the gift cards privately so mom and dad get to be the heroes, not us. That's pretty neat. Uh, how do we know who needs the gift cards? Well, Pastor Lisa has some good connections with people in need, and sometimes people in the congregation know of a family having a tough time. Anyone can tell us about a need. Just talk to Pastor Steve, Pastor Lewis, Pastor Lisa, or Sarah Van Dornick. The tip will be treated confidentially. So when do we put up the tree? It's already up. Oh, I wanted to help. Can I put on the mittens? <laughs> there is no mittens. Just envelopes. Got it? Envelopes. <laughs> for money. <laughs> for needy families. Okay, I've got it. And I bet they all got it too now. <laughs> got it? Got it. Okay. Okay, we're done here.
If uh, you would now turn in your order of worship, we will be doing our responsive congregational prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Help us to really know you, to bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them, your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. Help us to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that by word and deed, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is praised. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Rule us by your word and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you. Keep your church strong and add to it. Preserve us guide us, and keep us, work through us, so your kingdom grows. Help us, Help us and all people, to reject our own wills, and to obey your will without any back talk. Your will alone is good. Help us, one and all, to carry out the work we are called to, as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Do take care of all our physical needs so that we come to know that you are the only source of everything good and that neither our work and worry nor your gifts can do us any good without your blessing. Be with our congregation, the Olsons, the Browses, the Evensons and their loss, those who suffer in silence, and those who have shared their concerns. Forgive us when we do not love our neighbors. May we offer to those, to those who need grace to people in the pews next to us and a word of hope to all of our neighbors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. In all of our lives, be glorified, Lord. Be with us when we face trials, and for those in need of comfort and care, bless them with your peace. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. To you be the glory both now and forever. We praise you and love you. We, we pray, pray this in the name of the, the Father, Father, the Son, and, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. We will now turn to our hymn of preparation number 615, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Also, children ages 3 through 1st grade can now be dismissed for Kids' Own Worship.
Please join me in prayer. God, we're so humbled by your grace, the gift of a Savior, the opportunity for forgiveness, salvation, and new life with you, and for the way that you call us to yourself. We can't save ourselves, we can't save each other, but we can respond to your soft and tender calling and your amazing mercy and love. Remind us of that calling this morning. Help us to share the good news with others. Help us to apply it to our own life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we conclude a message series through the book of 1 John with 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. I invite you to turn there or follow along on the screen as we read and then as we look closely at God's word together. 1 John 5, beginning at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of the Lord. When I graduated from seminary, I was 25 years old. That seems like a while ago. And at that time, my wife Joy and I moved to Iowa, and I began to serve as a solo pastor of a church. I had had a wonderful teaching church experience, and so I felt prepared for many things. But one thing I had not yet done was officiate at a funeral. It was what I was most nervous about. When would that happen? What would be the situation of death and how would it go? About three months into my time of serving there, my first funeral came. And it went smoothly, much with the help of experienced funeral directors who could coach me on where to stand and where to be. I remember the day after that, 
funeral, the surviving spouse called me. I wondered what she wanted to talk about. And then she told me that a family member who had served as a casket bearer at the service the day before went home after the time of lunch, sat in his recliner, and died of a heart attack. It struck me then, it still strikes me now, that the last time that man heard the gospel was the day before. I I guess he could have listened to a radio broadcast on his drive home, but chances were good that the last time he heard the gospel proclaimed was at that service. It reminded me, and it still reminds me, how important it is for us to hear the good news of Jesus and for those of us who stand behind pulpits to proclaim it clearly. Thankfully, the man was a believer. But it's a reminder for us of what matters most. So today's message, as we close from 1 John chapter 5, is a message about Jesus, the Son, the Savior, the one who was sent. As we wrap up this message series of living as children of God, we must be reminded of what it takes to become a child of God. We have considered throughout this study this fall how we can live by faith, how we can stand up against temptation, how we can pursue truth and purity and love. There were warnings by John against false teaching and engaging in continual sin. Today's message is about the basics of salvation, and all of us need to hear it for one of two reasons. Maybe, as we heard that hymn, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling, we are convicted that we have not yet responded to the gift of a Savior. And if that's the case, if you're sitting here this morning or you're not quite sure, then hopefully as we go through this passage and others, there will be a clear sense of how you can respond. Maybe you're here this morning and you are a believer. You've been a Christian for a long time. You still need to hear this message too because God places the call on all of us to share the good news of the gospel. And when we can understand it more clearly, we can explain it and tell others about Christ more clearly. So let's begin by considering the problem that we all face, the problem of sin. We must recognize at some point in our life the reality of our own sin. Now, it's easy to see the sin of others, to point the finger, to talk behind their back, to shake our head at the way that someone else is falling short. But when we look in the mirror, we must come to grips with our reality of sin. I wonder, how many of you have visited the Grand Canyon? It's an amazing, natural sight, isn't it? Let's say that all of us were there at the edge. Some of us, of course, would be riskier than others. We'd be pushing the limits. Maybe you had a child that did that and you had to pull them back when you were there. But let's say, don't try this, but let's say we were there and we decided to have a long jump contest. (laughs) We decided to see who could jump the farthest and, and see if anyone could clear it. And we got a really good running start. Some of us might jump two feet. Some of us might jump eight feet. Lewis, who's been picking on me in his sermon, so now he's getting it back. (laughs) Lewis might jump 15 feet. The world's long jump record is 29 feet, four and a quarter inches. And if you've been to the Grand Canyon, you know that none of those distances would even come close because there's this great chasm and no one can jump over it. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice, 
all have sinned and all of us fall short. None of us can cross the chasm of sin on our own strength or ability. Now, the sin problem wasn't the way it always was. If you begin to read your Bible from the beginning, you discover that God created the heavens and the earth good and without sin. Genesis 1 and 2 portray a a beautiful time in the garden for Adam and Eve and their relationship with God. The fact that they had no sin or shame. And God declared it was very good. But in Genesis 3, sin enters into the world. The fall, the fall into sin occurs. Sin is disobedience of God's command, of God's word. Sin is when we choose to put our will ahead of God's. And it happens every day in our lives. And it happened to those we might consider the, the best. Peter and Moses And Paul and David all sinned. Only Jesus has ever lived and not sinned. And our sin comes with a price. Sometimes we talk about how there's a price tag to something. Sin has a price and it's steep. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages, in this sense, refers to penalty or consequences. The wages of sin is death, and we think of that twofold. Physical death, because of sin in the world, unless Christ returns first, all of us will someday experience physical death. We are reminded of that when we see an obituary or when we drive past a cemetery. But along with physical death, there's something even more problematic, a greater penalty, and that's spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from God. Psalm 5, 4 through 6 tells us, You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men the Lord abhors. Without forgiveness of our sin, without a resolution to our sin problem, we can't dwell in the presence of God. And therefore, we, apart from the saving work of Jesus, will experience that separation, that spiritual death. God is holy and just. And he hates sin. But thankfully, he's done something about it. We must come to grips with the predicament that every person is born into, the sin problem. We must deal with our own sin problem, and we must do all we can to help others find hope and salvation for theirs. Now, if you were following along as I was reading 1 John 5, I told you a couple of weeks ago that many times in any passage of Scripture or any message that's proclaimed, there are some challenging verses. Sometimes these are the verses that those of us who are preaching would like to skip over. But we read the text together before the message, and so you know they're there. Here are two of them that I encounter in this text, verse 16 and 18. And I want to just give a a quick note on these two verses. Verse 16 says, If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. Now, here's what's challenging. When any of us read that, our first thought probably isn't even for our brother or sister. It's probably, what if I'm committing that sin that leads to death, sometimes referred to as an unforgivable sin? We know the good news of salvation is that when convicted, we can repent of our sin, that the Holy Spirit does convict us of sin. 
The sin that is being referred to here is likely the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. People who blaspheme the Holy Spirit and never repent will experience eternal death. A blasphemy of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit is a lifelong denial that the Spirit exists. It's a, a lifelong pushing away of God's effort to redeem us. And here's the good news. If you're sitting here and you're thinking, wow, I wonder if I've committed that or if I am committing that, the good news is you very likely haven't because you're convicted, you're concerned, you're worried about that. And that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does is convicts. So when it comes to verse 16, just pray for your friends and your family members. You don't know what's happening in their heart. You pray and leave it up to God to choose to give them life. And then a couple of verses later is verse 18. Verse 18 tells us, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Now, chances are really, really good that all of us sinned this past week. Probably yesterday, and perhaps, or maybe likely, already today. So when we read that, we start to think, anyone born of God does not continue to sin and I know that I sin, and you know that you sin, so are we born of God? Well, as we saw in chapter 3, verses 6 and 8, John is not teaching that believers will not sin, but rather that we must not continue in sin or deliberately, recklessly, and without repenting continue to sin. In fact, John reminds us in chapter 1 of the fact that we will sin and we can't deny it. Verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and pure us, purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. The reality is that all of us sin, and we're in a predicament. We can't atone for it, pay the price for it on our own. Just like a drowning swimmer needs a lifeguard and cannot save themselves as they're struggling in the water, we need a Savior, one who is without sin, to reach out and rescue us and make us right with God. Let me ask you, some of you are very talented. You have lots of experiences. You've done great things. Is there anyone here who thinks they might be able to save someone else from sin? Wow, not near as many hands as the, uh, the Grand Canyon. In fact, no hands because we can't. Even our best efforts can't save ourselves. Can't pay the price. Going to church regularly, showing acts of kindness to your neighbor, putting money in the offering plate, regularly celebrating the sacraments, those are responses to God's love, which we should do, but they're not brownie points that earn salvation. Jesus is the only one who can save, and all of us need a Savior. So what do we do with our predicament? Well, we must understand God's grace through Jesus Christ. This is the reason Jesus came. Christmas is coming, isn't it? We see lights all over. We see the giving tree out in the hallway. <laughs> Christmas is that time that we celebrate when God sent his son, when God took on human flesh. 
Jesus came to save. Look at Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Only the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, the shedding of his blood, can meet the justice and righteousness that God demands. Only through Jesus can we be reconciled with God. Here's another show of hands. Nothing to be embarrassed about here. I expect some raising hands here. How many of you have already purchased a Christmas gift? All right. Now, remember where you hide it or you're going to find it next summer. <laughs> the greatest gift, I'm sure you bought a great gift for your friend or loved one, but the greatest gift, of course, is Jesus. And it's the gift of grace. Grace, G-R-A-C-E. I once was taught that that could stand for God redeeming at Christ's expense. Grace. We need grace. We must respond to God's grace because when we do, Jesus allows us to cross that chasm that we talked about earlier. Jesus brings us from death to life from sinful humanity into the very presence of God. We must respond to God's grace through repentance and faith. Faith is another word for belief or believing. In fact, the Apostle John, we're reading his letter of 1 John, was used by God to write the Gospel of John. And in that, he often uses the word belief and how we must believe. Another passage from Romans. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. We must, upon learning of the predicament of sin, put our faith in or believe in Jesus and confess him openly as our Savior and Lord. Savior, the one who saves. Lord, the one whom we submit our life to. And we can do that through prayer, through a conversation with God. We don't have to pray through someone else. We can just talk to God and tell him how sorry we are for our sins. Ask him to forgive us, to take control of our life, to fill us with the Holy Spirit. This means giving our lives, our thoughts, and our selfish, sinful nature over to Christ. The Bible reminds us of this often in one of the most familiar passages of Scripture, one you might see in the end zone if you're watching a football game this afternoon. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Or if you still have your Bible open, look at 1 John 5, 5, and then verses 11 and 12. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. There's that word believe again. Look at verse 11, and this is the testimony God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Accepting Christ, believing and repenting, gives us eternal hope and assurance. I've listed some passages on your message outline that are passages of the assurance of salvation. Verse 13 of our passage is one of them. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Apostle John in this whole book fighting against the Gnostics wants us to know the truth. 
and to know the assurance we can have in Christ. Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1789, Nothing is certain but death and taxes. But John, the Apostle John, reminds us of another certainty. We can know with certainty that we have eternal life if we repent and believe in Jesus. But that's not where it stops. Once we become a redeemed child of God, that phrase again is in this book, children of God, once that happens, out of gratitude, we must live for Christ. It's a lifelong pursuit of having him as our Lord. You know, the first weeks that I preached here, beginning in mid-August, we covered the cultural mandate impacting the kingdom for Christ, the great commandment to love God and love others, and the great commission to go out and make disciples. Those three are a key component, a, a foundation for how, in response to what Jesus has done, we live our lives. And John reminds us in this chapter that part of living for Jesus is obeying his commands and living by faith. Look at verses 2 through 4. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We live by faith as disciples. Jesus called his disciples saying, come follow me. And Jesus calls us to follow him daily. We don't just respond to the good news and then wait around for Jesus to return or call us home like Charlie Brown sat waiting for the great pumpkin. No, we have to be on the move, living for Jesus, making a difference in this world, being salt and light, putting him first. And on that note of putting him first, John closes this chapter with a warning in verse 21. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Idols are anything that get in the way of living as children of God. An idol is anything that we worship, and the word worship is, uh, is, is from the word worth, the worth of something. We have gathered to worship God this morning because he is of ultimate worth. Idols are something that we put more worth in or put ahead of God. Here's some examples that we likely all struggle with. Wealth, pleasures, lust, power, work, family, material things, self, or the applause of others. Those can be common idols in our lives. I wonder, is there another idol that you identify in your life? Something that you are giving too much worth to? And in a sense worshiping. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. In other words, stay focused on Christ. When children are young, they learn the ABCs. I wonder, as you look at your message outline and have a chance to fill in the blank, if you have carried out the ABCs of salvation. So we're just, uh, we're just summarizing here. ABC. A, admit your sin and need for a Savior. B, believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And C, commit to follow Jesus as the Lord of your life as you ask Him in prayer to become your Savior and devote your life to Him. When you do, He will not only save you, but empower you with His Spirit. So let me ask you, where are you at when it comes to trusting in Jesus and living as a child of God? If you have become a child of God, then live as a child of God. But you can't live as a child of God 
if you haven't become a child of God. We make lots of decisions in life, but the decision to accept Christ is the greatest decision we will make or not make. It will impact our life here on earth and for all of eternity. It will impact everyone in this room. So let me ask you, have you taken the step? Have you accepted Christ? If not, what are you waiting for? God's arms are open wide, and he's longing for you to trust in him. That man that I told you about earlier, one day he was carrying a loved one's casket, watching as they gathered at the cemetery and lowered it into the ground. And a few days later, that same thing was happening to him. We don't know when the end of our earthly life will come. But in the midst of that unknown reality, we can know and have assurance through faith in Jesus that someday we will be with him in heaven. And for that to occur, we must become a child of God. And as we've learned through this series, children of God seek to live for God. Amen. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, you showed us the fullness of your love by sending Jesus into the world to die for our sin. You make it possible for us to be forgiven and to become your children. Thank you for offering us the gift of grace, salvation, and eternal life. I pray that those who have not yet received that gift will choose to place their faith in you today. For those of us who have taken that step, help us to share the good news with others who so desperately need to hear it. And help us to have a greater sense of urgency ourselves for reaching those who are spiritually lost. Thank you for the gift of your spirit who works in us. Continue to work in us and through us as individuals and as a church. We thank you for your amazing love and the gift of a mighty Savior. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of, a, one of the ways that we can respond to God's grace is by being stewards of all that he has entrusted to us. A steward is a caretaker. And God has given us many gifts and talents and treasures to use for his glory. As the offering is collected this morning, we have an opportunity to give a portion back to God of what he has first given to us.
God, we thank you for gathering us this day where we can see you working through this congregation, bringing gifts back to you from the bells to the chancel choir to even using students help spur us on in generosity to a call of worship. Strengthen us, we pray. Use these gifts that you have brought forth to expand your kingdom, and may we always live as children of God for your glory, as we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's hymn of response is number 327, When We Walk with the Lord. Friends, as you go forth to respond to the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to live as a child of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.